It's good to be back. Good to see you. Let me tell you how I understand the church. Um, I believe that the church has a fundamental purpose. And within that broad and important purpose, it has a mission. And that is how the church can fulfill its purpose the best. And within that, sometimes a local church can have a vision, which is how it proposes to fulfill the mission in its own local context. So if all these things are understood correctly, then a church can simply aim at the center of the target to hit its vision. Because if it does that, it's automatically going to fulfill its mission and its purpose. But if all else fails, if a local church has never formed uh, a, a particular vision, which is very common actually, or even if it goes through a period where it's unclear about its mission, which would be very tragic, a church must always hit the target still in terms of its fundamental purpose. Cannot miss the target completely. Today we're going to look at what we absolutely have to hit in order to be a faithful church. It's behind everything else. We must fulfill our purpose, which is to glorify God. It's one of those things that's so basic, you wonder if you have to say anything about it, but basic things you do have to talk about, don't you? Our text is going to be Psalm 19. It's a great uh, passage, of course. I'm going to read it for you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heaven, makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and right, altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. For who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. And then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The heavens declare the glory of God. God's glory is the purpose of the universe. I mean, you've no doubt seen uh, projections depicting the size of the known universe. We just saw the solar system. You can get projections of galaxies and mega galaxies and so on. Uh, but you don't need computer graphics to know this. All you need, all you need is one night under a truly clear sky without haze and without light pollution. Now there is no photograph that can capture that experience. My words cannot capture that experience. But if you have ever truly seen the sky, and probably many of us here have not, but if you have ever truly seen the sky, then I don't have to explain it to you. The glory of God in its vastness, in its beauty, in its awe is often first experienced viscerally in the night sky. And if you've if you have never seen that, then I, I urge you to do whatever it takes to do so, at least once in your life. Our functional world, the world in which we live every day, it, it's bounded by a very small horizon. Our daily universe fits within comfortable driving distance. 
The night sky changes everything. You realize that reality is a whole lot bigger than you were used to thinking. It was all out there, but you couldn't see it. And at night, the winters open up, and, and you can see it. The real world, which you thought was within driving distance, the real world, the real universe is huge. There's so much more to it than I, than I can even dream. I look at the night sky and I realize that somebody controls all this, and it's not me. Makes me wonder how much I do control. The universe is so big. How do my little dreams fit in, or my accomplishments, or even my life? It's not that, that I think my life is insignificant. I know it's not. The re but, but, but reality is so big. There are bigger purposes than mine. There's a bigger life than mine. And clearly, the importance of my small life is based on the same thing as the Milky Way. We both have meaning as we are connected to God, our common creator, connected to his glory, which it proclaims. The English word for glory translates the Hebrew word heavy. Glory describes God's heaviness, his substance, his gravitas. The Bible says that all things were created by him and for him. And in him all things hold together. Everything finds its meaning and its connection with God by simply fulfilling the purpose he designed for it to have. That's all. In God's design, nothing has to strive or change in order to share his glory. It simply has to be what he designed it to be. God designed the universe to demonstrate his invisible character much the way that artists or landscapers or mechanics or knitters or writers do what they do. They long to express in some outward, some material way, what's inside of them, who they are. That's because we're, we're in God's image. The universe is God's canvas. It is his novel. It is his project. It exists for one reason. We exist for one reason, to express and reflect and glorify him. Him. That's true for everything. It's, fr it's true for nuclear fission and magnetic fuel, uh, fields and gravity. It's true for solar flares and the rings of Saturn. It's true for thunder. Elephants, beetles, and every blade of grass, and every human being. We were never created for ourselves. We are the creation of someone else, for someone else. And even if you and I were ignorant of that fact, and we lived our even lives that dishonored God, we still were created for the purpose of glorifying him and not for the purposes we fashion for ourselves. And yet humanity, among all the creatures that we know about, is uniquely able to ignore and resist God's glory. It has to do with the amazing faculties God has given us to be his image, like moral freedom. Seashells, iron deposits, grasshoppers have no problem filling their niche, as God defined it, but not us. We have used the faculties God has given us to pretend his glory is irrelevant. We can even transform religion into an exercise in glorifying ourselves. Did you know that the Bible defines sin in terms of God's glory? Sin is not just the violation of a code. That's, that's how we can identify sin. But it's not exactly what sin is. Romans 1 says that sin is refusing to glorify our creator. Abandoning his glory in order to worship and pursue our own devices. Sin is the ridiculous assumption that a created thing gets to define its own purpose. And what sin does is to detach us from orbit around God. What would happen if the earth flew out of its orbit around the sun? The sun that rises at one end of the heavens makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its life-giving heat. Detaching ourselves from the sun means death. And anything disconnected to God, from God's glory, 
a bird, the solar system, a human being loses its meaning and its significance and its very life becomes nothing more, more than cosmic dust. The Bible records God's plan. Plan is such a passive word. It's his personal crusade to bring us back into orbit, to save us from a future of meaningless dust and shine upon us so that we might live again and reflect his glory again. Prophets and apostles proclaim the renewed, the restored, the resurrected life that God offers, that he brings those who turn to him in faith and exalt his glory as the heaviest thing in their life that which is most substantial, that which is most real, and around which everything else orbits. The inspired words of the prophets and apostles were recorded in an equally inspired written form. In our psalm, David uses all the words he can think of to summarize it. He talks about law, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances. And if he could have looked into the future, he might have included gospels and epistles and sermons like Hebrews and apocalyptic like Revelation. And we call this whole Bible God's Word. There's absolutely nothing like it anywhere in any culture in any age. Sixty-six books written by a wide assortment of men over centuries who didn't know each other, using a wide variety of literary styles, each describing his own experience, and yet the Bible reads very convincingly as one book. You can easily trace progressive themes of Revelation from Genesis to Revelation. It's an overarching story. One single mind put it together. I didn't grow up with the Bible. That's not something I heard about and was indoctrinated in. And I wasn't ignorant of other religions. I discovered the Bible as an atheist. I studied it and it knocked my socks off. What did I find there? A lot of things, but mostly what I found there is the glory of God. A glory revealed in Jesus Christ, and we're going to dive into Christ's role in this next week when we talk about the mission. But this revelation called the Bible, when I believed it, it reconnected me with God's glory. And when that happened, another life that had been hurtling off into the void was saved. I found my humanity, a humanity that Psalm 8 says God always intended to be crowned with glory. So Psalm 19 teaches us two things. You know, you, you saw it was in kind of in two parts. The first half said that the purpose of all things is to glorify God. You know, the way David, somebody would say it in that day, would be everything under the sun. So he talks about the sun, but it's everything in the sky, everything under, everything proclaims God's glory. And the second half, is that since sinners do not glorify him, God has given us a written revelation to get us reconnected to his glory. What does this mean for us? It means so much personally. But let me just share two thoughts about what it can mean for us as a church. And they come kind of from the two parts of the, of the psalm. SPEP exists for God's glory. That is our purpose. And that's the most important thing about us. First of all, God's glory just it has to drive our worship. It has to drive our worship. And that first half of the psalm kind of was very worshipful. And worship is something we're going to be thinking about for a while. We've got a search committee now looking for our next music director, worship director. What a title. What a, what a tremendous honor and responsibility, an important part in the church. Such a change is very, very important. This is a sensitive time for the church. You may remember 12 years ago when, when Brian came on board, adjusting to new worship leadership was a challenge. And God blessed us big time, big time. And I'm confident he's going to do that again. But only if we keep our focus on worship, on God himself, and avoid the worship wars that only weaken churches. You know what I'm talking about with worship wars? You know, different factions in a church pushing to promote their own favorite musical styles or ambiance that they prefer. You younger ones are going to find this very hard to believe, but there was a time when a single TV was the only source of entertainment in the home. And whoever controlled the remote controlled what everybody saw. That's not the case now anymore. So many family members have their own access to their own entertainment. But, but worship is still something that we all have to experience together. 
And worship wars happen when we try to grab for the remote, okay? It's going to be very important for us to express our preferences and work the hard, as hard as we can to make our worship the very best that we possibly can. But worship is not going to be about glorifying our preferences, is it? Worship is about glorifying God. Worship is about ascribing to the Lord the glory that is due him. And that's what we gather together in worship to do, to ascribe him glory. That's what, that's what we sing. It's why we sing. It's, it's to make his praise glorious together. In worship, we must never be satisfied with just enjoying ourselves. We glorify God in worship by enjoying him. Not enjoying music as if we were watching a program or attending a concert. Not enjoying the clever thoughts of the preacher or how cute the kids are, although all those things are neat and we want to enjoy them alongside. Maybe they're actual vehicles and help they function, but, but worship is 100% about God. What we want in our worship is to taste a little bit of what we experience on our backs when we're ready to just fall into a sky full of stars. Whether we do that in a living room or an auditorium or a sanctuary or a full-blown cathedral, we want to get away from the noise and the light pollution of our world and just see it once again, see it, that my bounded universe is only big enough for me. But the real universe is so big, only God can fill it. And praise God, I don't have to craft my own meaning. And praise God, I don't have to justify my existence. And praise God, I don't have to attain every goal my little world pushes in my face. Praise God, I'm not enslaved by my own little dreams and puny lusts, and I don't have to control everything. Praise God, I don't have to be God. And praise God that he is. He is. My God is more wonderful and wise, more potent and powerful than I can grasp. But while I cannot grasp him, he holds me in the hands of Christ. While heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain him, I can rest against his chest and I can hear his heart beating. Even though sitting on his lap means sitting on a throne of glory before which the angels hide their faces, I can still feel his arms owning me. Who cares who wins worship wars if God doesn't win our worship? That's what's going to be important, not whether I get what I want. What's most important is that we all get to reconnect with the one who fills the mind and blows the mind and fills the heart and overflows the heart, who happily accepts those poor offerings that we scrape together to bring in, you know, our money, our plans, our ministries, and he accepts them from us so carefully, so carefully, so gently, so that our treasures of paper and paste and scotch tape don't, don't collapse. And then he gives us back something that goes exceedingly beyond all that we ask and imagine. Real joy. Joy so real that you, it, it makes you weep. Real hope. Hope that's enough to counter any pressure that is coming against me. And real love. The love of Christ that disassembles inner prisons and leaves me free to share my life with others. The purpose of the church is to glorify God in worship. To lift him up. To lift him up. And not to stop and not to rest until he lifts us up. The other, the other theme in our psalm is that the church's purpose is to glorify God is pursued in the faithful use of his word. That's how we do it. The written word of God is how sinners reconnect to God's glory. No worship is possible. Nothing of any substance without God's word. Anybody can go out. Anybody, it says that the language goes out through all the world. Anybody can go out and look at the sky and feel, mm, wow, there must be a great God. And then if they just put their own mind to it and go their own way, they could think they glorify God by blowing people up. We need God's word to instruct us, to tell us what he is like, that we might glorify him right. And the Bible has been commissioned by the Lord to record the message of his prophets and apostles. It's a message carved and made, not in human philosophy, but carved in human history 
a message from first to last about Christ and how he reconnects us with the glory of God. There is no knowledge of God's glory apart from the word. The night sky enables us to sense his glory in all languages. But God's word helps us to understand his glory preached in a specific language that I speak. Our connection with God's glory depends on understanding the Bible accurately. David talked about law, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances. He trained himself to understand the differences between those things, how to approach those things appropriately. Some parts of the Bible are like low-hanging fruit. You just read it and you got it. But there, there's more depth, a little bit higher up, for anybody who takes the trouble to reach up to get it. And when we believe that word, we're connected with God's glory. He, he revives our souls. He revives a part of us we thought was dead, or maybe never even knew existed. His glory awakens the mind, rejecting simplicity or foolishness with wisdom. We look back on ideas and convictions we thought were so profound, so pro sophisticated, See how stupid we were? And we can see that because we're not quite so stupid. You know, before my conversion, I believed that human souls didn't exist, even though I am one. How stupid is that? My philosophy explained away my humanity as an illusion. That was helpful. God's glory gets us thinking straight, and we discover our soul, and it, it comes alive. In his word, God's glory makes our soul smile. You know, there's a smile that doesn't make it up to the eyes. Well, the, the, the joy that we have in God's word goes beyond that, right down to our soul. It makes our soul smile. And why not? Because in all the darkness around us, God's word enables us to see. See, see that there's more to life than just coping. We can have relationships we never thought we could have. Our road, our path does not end at the grave. That God's more than just an idea, and in Christ he becomes my friend. Such light brings joy to my heart. Through his word, God's glory makes life pure, simple, one thing. Just putting God first, the way Jesus tells me to, is usually enough to guide me in everything. The law of love is all we need but we're growing, sometimes we get confused. So God gives us wonderful ordinances and commandments that interpret love when we need it. Through his word, God's glory makes us wealthy, regardless of how much money we have. It makes life sweet, no matter how bitter it is. Through his word, God's glory frees us to face our greatest faults and our fears. His glory makes it unnecessary to live in hiding, either hiding my weaknesses from others or even hiding my failures from myself. And we discover the rewards of obedience and the glorious delight that comes out of being freed from sin. When God's word guides you into the presence of the living God, you find that you're no longer dealing just with words on a page. You end up like David. You start by using the word to talk about God, you end up talking to him. Can't help yourself, because God's word is connected you back with his glory. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. The purpose of anything is to glorify God. As a church, we're going to want to aim for a bullseye. We're going to aim to attain a vision. But if we were to miss everything else, we mustn't miss the target completely. Whatever we do, let's be about the glory of God. Let's put him first. Let's put him first in everything. Let's put him first in everything all the time. Let's make it our passion to be what he wants us to be and do what he wants us to do because that's why we're here question for us to talk about this week. I urge you to discuss how can we better focus on God's glory right here as a church. How can we do that better? We got a link on the front page of the website if you want to share your thoughts and another link there if you want to see what other people say. And just to keep us honest, let's talk a little bit also about how 
I could better focus on God's glory too. Let's pray. Father, we long, to, uh, we long to stimulate thoughts of your glory. We raise up high ceilings and we use a little stained glass and we make some big, beautiful music. But even so, we still can't duplicate the infinite sky at night. But while the setting isn't the same, you're the same. You're the same. You're the same. And to the eyes of faith, your glory is always breathtaking. Lord God, give us eyes of faith. And in particular, give us eyes of faith as we meet here together and worship you. And give us eyes of faith at home when we get alone to worship you or gather the family around. We want, we want your glory in our worship. We'll do our very best with our music and our prayers and our preaching. We'll do the best we can possibly do. But what we want to do is glorify you. We want your glory as we swim in your word. We, we long to be cleansed and buoyed up and refreshed by you as we meet you there in your word. If your glory is found in your word, then that's where we're going to be. Lord, we know what it is to live without your glory. And we've tasted what it means to live in it. So glorious Lord, be our God. And let us be your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.